Well, hello, this is Jenny Gallagher for Designs by Juju. Today we are going to learn to make this reading pillow. As you can see, we've got stippling on the pocket front. We have one design on this side and another embroidery design on this side. We are not going to be showing how to actually do the applique and embroidery stitches. We are gonna focus on the quilting or stippling of the pocket and placement of these designs and then assembly of the actual pillow, okay? So um, this pillow includes the pocket to install your form behind your pretty front, okay? It also includes instructions on attaching this handle, okay? For easy carrying. So, take my book out, it's heavy. And then you can see that the pillow form just pops in and out right through that opening. Okay? So we're gonna talk about our materials list first. Keep in mind that Designs by Juju has provided this stippling and these embroidery designs free to you if you are a member of her um, Designs by Juju Embroidery Blessings group on Facebook. So you just go to that Facebook page and the links to all those designs will be in an announcements post at the very top of the group page, okay? So let's move this aside and let's look at our fabric pieces that we're going to need. We're gonna talk about fabric prep in just a minute, but we're first gonna look at these um, pieces. For the pillows I make, I cut an 18 inch by 18 inch square back, an 11 by 18 front top of the pillow, an 11 by 18 front bottom of the pocket, an 11 by 18 front pocket lining, a 10 by 17 piece of fleece or batting or felt or whatever you wanna to use to make your quilting design um, thick looking you'll need a piece of fabric three by 18 to bind for your pocket edge. You'll also need, if you want to make the handle, a three by 10-ish um, inch um, piece of fabric for the handle, and then interfacing or heat and bond, cut just an inch smaller all the way around um, to provide some sturdy stability to the handle so it'll last longer. I don't typically put handles on the pillows I make my grandkids, but um, I've seen a lot of requests in different groups, especially in um, Juju's group about placing handles, so we are gonna do that for you, okay? So you can screenshot this picture while you're watching the video if you want, so you'll have um, the list saved and you won't have to go back and watch the whole video to find this list again, okay? So now we're gonna look at the actual fabric pieces that we will be using. Okay, so you'll see here I have an 18 inch square piece of fabric cut for the back. It's laid um, right side up for now. We'll flip it over when we get ready to put it together, but this way you can see what it looks like. The front top part of the pillow matches my back. Most of the time it actually does not. You can match or not. This is the lining that will be inside the front pocket. After we do our quilting, this is what covers up all of the stitching and quilted fabric on the back of the pocket. This will be our front bottom pocket where you would place your embroidery design here and here once we've done the quilting or stippling. This is a piece of purple fleece. It's just a piece of leftover fleece that I had and I've cut it one inch smaller all the way around than my pocket fabric and my lining fabric so that 
um, I minimize the amount of fabric inside my stitching. I use about a half inch um, seam allowance all the way around. This is the three by 18 piece of binding and I've already pressed it. We're gonna talk about that in more detail in just a minute. But this will be what joins your front bottom pocket to the pocket lining once we're done with our stippling. And then if you want to make a handle, you'll need this piece of fabric here, your three by 10-ish. I think mine is 10 and a half inches long. I like that length. That's 10 and a half to 11 is usually what I do make handles out of for bags and such. Then you'll need a piece of two by nine, give or take, of some sort of interfacing or heat and bond light, whatever you wanna iron on in this fashion to stiffen your handle, okay? Everybody here with me? Okay. So I will clarify that we are, because of um, some issues that we had with Facebook Lives, we are doing things a little bit differently. So we're gonna try this, and again, we'll listen to your feedback, um, which we truly appreciate, and we'll try to make adjustments. A couple of things I do want to let you know about before we get started. When we do Facebook Lives, um, a couple of things happen. One is my internet on my end is impacted, but also the internet you're using is impacted. And when you multiply that times three to 500 people trying to come online and watch us all at once, that strains the capabilities of that particular network all around the, the world, but it's concentrated in um, the Designs by Juju group as we or any group. If, if you're in any group, this is going to happen. It, con it concentrates the amount of strain on that data availability. Another thing that impacts um, sound or quality, pixelating, graininess of the, of the videos on Facebook Live um, might include the number of devices that are on your internet. So for instance, if you have four people in your home and your kids are upstairs gaming and you're trying to watch a video on Facebook Live, then it's very possible that that extra strain is going to pixelate or impact <clears throat> impact your um, transmission speed and quality of, of pictures and sound. So we do apologize for the issues we had. We are working on trying to correct that. I even have a microphone that I'm using for sound, so I hope that significantly improves the quality of our videos. Um, but if you ever have issues of, with any of our videos, just let us know and we'll see what we can do on our end. Um, but always double check how many devices might be running background apps that you're not aware of, um, draining some of your internet um, data rates and transmission rates. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is start assembling our pocket. So we're gonna take the front bottom pocket and the fleece or your batting. And we're gonna turn the fabric right side down. And we're going to carefully place our fleece as square as we can. Speaking of square, that's another significant um, thing to pay attention to when you're cutting. If you have a quilt mat like you see I'm working on, that's ideal for using your rotary cutter and a straight edge to do all of your cuts because you want a square pillow when you're done. You don't want a wonky pillow. So make sure you spend enough time getting your cuts square and you'll see here I'm using a design that actually has dots that are in nice neat rows. So if I get wonkiness on this particular design or on the um, box pillow I've already made, it had stripes up and down, you'll be able to see and you'd be able to tell if the squares weren't perpendicular to your seams right there. You'd be able to see that and it wouldn't look very nice. Okay, so now let's put 
these together. So we've got these lined up. I'm going to take my notes off. We're going to straighten this out nice and straight. The preparation for your reading pillow <clears throat> might take a little extra time to do some of these steps, but it is well worth it to be able to have a pretty and quality product when you're done. So now that I've got these where I want them, I'm gonna take my temporary spray. Turn this up just a little bit for y'all. There we go. Um, I use a Dritz temporary adhesive. It is not required whatsoever. I know some people have illness and can't use um, sprays. There are temporary fabric glue sticks and glue pens um, if you choose to use those. Um, and you don't really have to have an adhesive at all. I like it because it provides a little bit of temporary security until I get some pins and stitches going. And so I just peel this back a little bit and just give it a little squirt on this side and this side. And then fold my fabrics back out. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to identify some centers. We are going to take the fabric and its fleece backing. And we're going to pin. You can use fabric markers. My fabric marker is purple, so I thought it might be a little difficult to show up. So we're just going to mark with pins. But you want to mark the straight up and down. Very center. Very center. Okay. If you'll hand press this nice and firmly, you will sort of hand iron a little seam in there so we'll be able to use that as we open this up and lay it on our stabilizer. So you'll see I already have hooped some tear away. I don't use tear away stabilizer a lot. Um, but this is one of the projects that I use tear away on most of the time. You'll see I have some purple lines. Can you see those? So what I have done is I've taken and marked my centers and I have marked the edging of my stitching area all the way around top and bottom and sides so that I know no matter where I lay this only the part inside there is going to get stitched on. And that's important when you're doing three different hoopings. What's going to happen is we're going to hoop the center panel of the stippling first. Then we'll stitch the stippling on the other two side panels next using some of these same markings to help align them. Okay? Hope everybody's following along. If you have questions as I move through the tutorial, once this is posted on Facebook or on the website, you can feel free to email or comment and we will answer your question as quickly as possible. So I have my center. I know that my fleece fabric remember was 10 inches by 18, 17 inches. And I know that I've marked my six by 10 frame. So I know the stitching is going to go edge to edge on my fleece. That's really good. If you are using a four by four or five by seven, you're not going to go edge to edge. You're going to have a piece of yours done at a time and you'll move and adjust just exactly the same way. You'll just have more hoopings that you have to do but you'll do the same process. You'll start with centers and you'll move outward so that you wind up with evenly distributed stitches. So we're gonna line up center and center 
remembering to account for the unfolded part. This part isn't part of the right or the left side of this pillow pocket. And so as you see, as I press it down, it comes closer to the line. You wanna to try to make sure this is as straight and right as perfect as you can, and perfect as you can. So here's the top edge of stitching, here's the bottom edge of stitching. And then we carefully unfold it without shifting, without pushing or pulling, and we press it gently onto the hooped stabilizer, which I did spray just a tiny bit of adhesive beforehand. This particular technique doesn't require tons of pins. If you've watched any of my tutorials in the past, you know that I typically baste everything down or pin all the way around, pin touching to pin. But because of the fleece, the batting, that extra thick layer um, serves as additional stabilizer, and so it's much less likely to shift, pull, and give. So two or three pins are really all you need. As you can see, I just did one in each corner. So we're gonna stick this on the machine. Let me shift my camera around for you here. All right, so I have saved some of the designs that I use on a repeated basis on my machine. This is a buttonhole that I use all the time. This is my Juju stippling design. So we're gonna set that, and then you'll see it comes up with just all these curly cued um, stitching. And we know that it's gonna be the right size, 9.5 by 5.9. And if you want to use your locating um, tool, you can press that and that, and it will show you the the hoop will move around the machine so that you can see where the edges are going to stitch. But we know where they're going to stitch, so we're just going to skip that. And I already have my red thread because I have red dots, and I wanted y'all to be able to see the stitching as well when we get done. So we're threaded and ready to go. And while that's stitching, I'm going to check my notes and see if there's anything I forgot. I think that we didn't go over yet is the fabric prep. So I'll talk about that while the machine is stitching. For fabric prep, um, a lot of embroiderers and digitizers do recommend that you pre-wash and pre-shrink your fabrics. I don't because I don't do this for a business. I do this for fun and I've not had any significant issues with my kids or grandkids reporting any problems with significant shrinkage. Um, typically I do recommend almost anything that you launder as a finished embroidery or applique project that you do take the item out of the dryer still wet and warm and either hang it or lay it flat to dry for optimal um, appearances once it's done. I do use um, color catchers on any product that I make that runs the risk of fading onto each other, especially towels. The towels are notorious for um, leaking colors and fading onto other things. So you do want to be aware of that with your fabric choices. You do want to also be aware that with um, knit fabrics, um, 
you're going to have some stretching. So if you're mixing knits with your woven's for these ready reading pillows or pocket pillows, um, do be aware of that. It can cause a, a little bit of shifting of the fabric, stretching out the fabric and designs, just not stay um, as pretty unless you secure the knit with a stabilizer. My personal preference for knit stabilization is a Pellon product called, um, that's just called Usable Knit Interfacing. It's at Walmart, Joann's, I found it several places and it's relatively inexpensive. And it comes in white and black, so it's good for um, light colors or dark colors. And I usually put it on the insides of all my t-shirts that I make my great kids too. So as you're prepping your fabric, um, you do want to wash it, dry it, iron it, um, and then cut it nice and square. When I iron my fabrics, no matter what type of fabric it is, cotton or knit, winky um, or fleece, I will press it and spray it with magic sizing or spray starch of some sort. And... Um, that helps to stabilize the fabric and um, help eliminate shifting. Okay, so now we have one of our three turn you back around where y'all can see we have one of our three panels done. So this is where we take out the pins and we pay close attention to a few important details. So you'll see that at the very edge of my stitching I have taken and marked a little blue marker up here the greens are for something else I did last year on both ends so you can see I've marked actually with a blue sharpie on my hoop itself because the stabilizer is going to come out and we're going to put new in I want to be able to reline up on the new stabilizer. So don't mark on your stabilizer alone. You want to make sure you mark on your hoop some kind of way. So I have marked the edges on both sides. And that's the edge of the stitch area. So that when I lay the next panels down, I know where to either move one way or the other so that I line up very close but not touching this panel I've already stitched. So to trim this out of the stabilizer, I'm gonna take my handy dandy rotary tool and slice very close and very carefully all the way around. Um, yes, this is tearaway stabilizer I'm using, but you only have one simple row of stitching and so if you start tearing, it's very easy to rip or pull this stitching out. It's not like um, tearing away from a big applique design or a really densely stitched word um, or character. And so you don't want to use tear away and tear it on this project. You still want to cut it. And so you'll see that for the most part, I have cut almost exactly along the drawn off marks I'd made for my stitched area. And that's exactly what stitched. So I will mention a couple of things. I've seen a couple of questions in the Facebook group about this lately. So I will mention that when I trim my threads on the backs of designs, 
I never trim close. If you trim close, your knots that are there, you run the risk of the knots coming undone. So you don't want to trim real close to that. You want to leave about a half inch or so, an inch of thread just loose and hanging. I don't like leaving the jumps on the back, especially for clothing. For this, it doesn't matter. It's going to be covered. But on clothing, you want to be careful because little fingers, little fingernails get caught in tiny little bitty seams. And then they snag and mess up your beautiful work that you've done. So I don't um, trim all the way to the edge. All right, so we're going to take and get rid of that piece of stabilizer. We're going to place our new layer. You can see this time how it's actually hooped. So I lay my stabilizer on, allowing for my hoop, top and bottom. I do one quick little spray. I don't spray until it's glued down. I just spray enough to give it a tiny little bit of security while I'm working. And I try to press that in, as y'all saw, with fairly firm, even pressure all the way around my hoop. Fold all of that out of the way. And then we're going to take and mark the same way this time as I did prepping for the video. And y'all didn't get to see that, so I'm going to do it the same way. So I use my quilt mat to help me with the lines underneath. I line up my green mark with my green mark, and I make my center mark. I line up my divots here and mark my center. And then I take and mark the top edge of stitching and the sides. And I am not being in a real slow process. I'm hurrying for y'all, so mine might not be perfectly straight. But you want to take the time and do this very, very carefully. Because this is what's going to make or break your pillow from looking straight, even, and professional. So take your time. Mark these marks very, very carefully. And don't rush this particular process. So, now we have our panel in the middle done. We're going to stitch this one over here. I'm going to take and mark my top right corner with just a little divot, a little divot here, a little upside down T. So I can keep the top of my design, the top of my design. I don't want to be flipping it back and forth um, as I'm working. So we're going to take and fold this nice and straight, matching up your straight lines. And then we're going to flip this over and we're going to line this up almost on that purple line. I'm going to come over that blue line on my hoop and purple line on my stabilizer. I'm going to come over just a smidge because remember I don't want stitching to touch stitching. I want there to be just a tiny bit of space between the new stitch line and the stitch line I just made. So you can use a pencil or just make you a little um, a little tiny ruler. You can use a chopstick, something just to help make sure you have a tiny amount of space between your stitched edge and your new stitched edge. This is one place that I do recommend that you use a little bit of, of spray or something. I forgot to make my little cover, but I typically cover my hoop. But you wanna use a, t a little bit of spray right down this edge because if you don't, 
it's very possible that the foot, the presser foot on the machine, as it's stitching, it's going to come real close, way over here. And especially when you're doing like 4x4s and 5x7s and rehooping and rehooping, it's very possible that this edge can get caught under your foot. I've had it happen more than once. And then I have a knot that I have to undo and stitches I have to rip out. And that's never any fun. So once again, I'm going to put just a few little pins, mostly to help keep the weight stabilized because now this is very side heavy. So this part is heavier than this side. When we were stitching the middle, it wasn't that big of a deal, but now we have the weight here um, in the middle and we're stitching on the side. So you want to sort of make sure it's not going to shift or anything. So now this is ready for our next set of stippling. We'll flip this around so you can see again. So once you do, um, once you're working on this one of the second or third panels, you do want to watch and make sure that this excess fabric is not getting caught or shifted. As you can see, the movement of the hoop and the machine are making it wiggle and wobble all over the place. So you want to keep an eye on it um, and not let it shift and get caught in your stitching. I'm going to check my notes again, see if there are anything any other tips that I need to show you. While that's stitching, I will talk just a little bit about using your other size hoops. Um, go back to the table. So this is another piece of um, pocket panel that I have already made. Um, some of you will recognize this from the Facebook Live tutorial we did. Um, but this is six by 10, six by 10, six by 10. So when you're lucky enough to have a large enough um, um, embroidery hoop frame on your machine, you're, you're able to minimize this to three hoopings but you can do this even with a four by four design you just will have because your your fabric is 11 inches you can do this with three middle hoopings or even two of the four by four and then do each panel twice so if you wanted to do three you would hoop your middle one first and then you would hoop the second and the third. Then you would hoop the middle and the top and the bottom and the middle and the top and the bottom. Yes, it's a lot of hoopings, but for people that only are limited to the four by four frame, it's a great option to give you a beautiful finished product that looks just as good as anything from the um, larger frames. If you only wanted to do two, which would be okay, you would just have a wider unstitched band at the top and a wider one at the bottom, no big deal. Um, you could do four and four, uh, four inch, four inch, four inch, four inch. If you're using your five by seven, you can do the same with your um, five by seven frame. You'll still have a band unstitched at the top and one at the bottom. It's not significant. Um, if you're worried about it looking right, um, you can do um, yours the same way and split it into parts the same way. You're just going to stitch multiple times in multiple hoops. The goal is to mark your fabric and centers so that all of your centers always line up. Okay? Alright, so we can hear the machine has stopped. 
So we're going to put this back on the table and prep for our third panel. And then we're going to talk about how to measure and mark and prepare your quilted design for your applique or embroidery design. The key here, no matter what you're stitching, is to always work from center. See, I should have moved that over just a tiny bit because they're really close. But once you put a design here, you're not going to be very aware of where that joint is. The good thing about Juju's um, quilted design is it's not all perfectly symmetrical. You'll see there's some tiny gaps here and some larger gaps here. So because of the significant irregularity, it's great for this kind of progress project, blah, excuse me, because it does allow for a variety of stitch gaps. And so it's much less noticeable when you do have to um, combine your um, designs this way. So once again, we're going to clip this out. If you don't have a mat and roller rotary cutter, I strongly encourage you to get one as soon as you can afford it because it is like one of my favorite tools, especially when I'm quilting or making reading pillows, anything like this that I have to keep going back and forth between machines um, and hoops. So you'll see that my um, purple lines, they're not real noticeable, but they're pretty close together, and that's what we want. You'll see that the top edge of stitching from one panel is really close in alignment with the other panel, top and bottom. So you want to make sure of that as you're stitching and going along. You don't want one to be significantly lower, higher, longer, or shorter than the other. Okay, third hooping of stabilizer. The same process applies, just a smidge. Some people will also use um, masks when they spray or a bandana. They'll cover their face because they do have um, sensitivities to aerosol sprays. So if you just want to use a spray, but feel like you can't, you might want to consider using some sort of um, medical mask or bandana fabric to cover your mouth and nose for that split second while you're spraying. Okay, so we have our stabilizer hooped, and I'm not going to take the time to draw actual real straight. We're going to do this real quick. I'm going to line up my centers and then I'm just going to zap a little. Oops, I went crooked. That's why you'd want to be straight. See how it went off a little bit? I was hurrying. This is why it's important to take your time. So when I really only need the edges. They're what's going to stick out from under the fabric when I lay it down. That's not straight. Let me line those two up. Okay. So we're going to take, where's our top right? Remember, our top right little fabric dot is right here. So we want to keep that on the top right. So when we lay this down, that's still the top right that we're working with, okay? So we fold this over, hand press this firmly, and then line this up just a little bit to the left of your marks. 
to allow for that little gap between sections. Open this up and then make sure you are pretty square. So using the lines underneath, I've lined up one edge here on one of my quilt mark quilt mat squares and I can see that my hoop edge is pretty square with the next row. This, this particular project requires you to be a little bit nitpicky about square and um, alignment. A lot of what we do in embroidery isn't this precise, but for you to end up with a beautiful pillow that you're proud to give or sell, take a little bit of time when you're first learning this. Once again, your glue stick, fabric um, glue pen or whatever you're using to glue that down goes right there. Um, I do not recommend using Elmer's glue um, because the needle will be going over some of this and you don't want to gunk up your machine's needle. It'll cause trouble. Okay. We're going to slide this back on the machine. And we're gonna let that go. There we go. Okay, it's stitching away. to figure out placement of the pretty stuff that you're going to embroider or applique on the fronts of your pillows. So we'll turn this back around. color. There we go. That's better. So, <clears throat> um, when you're putting two designs, you have to do a little bit of math, a little bit of marking. So, we know we have 18 inches less our seam allowances. So, we have about 17 inches that we could stitch on if we stitched edge to edge. Well, I don't want to do that and you probably don't either. So, I want a couple of inches on either side. So then I come in, um, I wanna leave an appropriate amount in the middle of wasted space. Sometimes you can use this space to either personalize with their name or you can put them closer together. Um, this part is really personal preference. You just want to do some math, you want to do some markings and we're gonna show you how to do that as soon as the machine is done with that third stippling panel, okay? took the pillow form out so you could see this laid out this way, okay? I'm gonna turn it because we're gonna use this in just a minute. And the machine's almost done. I wanna show you what I mean when I was talking about the stitching on that edge. See how the stitching is actually going off onto the hoop by itself? You don't want that foot to catch on that fabric. I've done that several times and it's really not fun. It can be quite scary because it will knot up your foot with fabric wrapped all around it, thread wrapped all around it, and make a significant little mess. All right, so we're done with that. 
And so now we're going to take this panel that is completely quilted, all nice and pretty. And we're going to figure out placement for our two free designs that Julie provided for us. Remember, if you want these designs for at all, they're free in the embroidery group. Designs by Juju bless, Embroidery Blessings group. There's a link on her webpage to the group. And there's a link on her Facebook page to the group. And so the there's a, a file that you just, a link that you click on so you can download the file. Right in that group in the announcements a part of the page, right at the top. So now we have three sections. And so, you know, we there's one of our joints. And... Here's the other. And so they're not really that noticeable. And once you put a design over both of them, you're not going to see where those um, joints are at all. So we know that um, we know the measurements of the designs because we can load them on the machine and look at the measurements. You can look in your software and find the measurements of the design exactly. You can look in your download where... Um, the designs are. You can figure out what the exact measurements of your design are in multiple ways. You can print it off and measure it. You can print it off and use a piece of paper. You know, here's the piece of paper for this design and here's the piece of paper for this design and you can kind of mark where you want it to go with your fabric marker, with pins, or whatever you want to make it work. But you want to think and be very careful about this step. It's another important place to take your time. So we're going to mark. Um, we want a couple of inches over here. So we don't want to stitch past about here. That'll give us about two inches. We don't want to stitch over here about two inches. So we're going to mark there. So we have that as our stitchable area. The one thing I, I did not mention in the Facebook live tutorial that I did is that I found that when I make my pillows some of the design if you look at lots of pictures on social media of people or even on Etsy of people making these you'll see that this happens a lot you'll notice that when you have the pillow sitting up here with its form in it some of this bottom part of the panel is down here. If your design is way down here, it's going to get lost in that fold, in that bend around the three-dimensional part of your pillow. So you do want to account for that. I typically move my, once I center them and decide where I want them, I place this fabric slightly higher, a half to one inch higher, no, lower. So the design is higher, is what I'm trying to say. So I wind up with this, instead of being perfectly centered, it's up just a bit. See that? So if I center it, it's the design would be about here. Okay? But I move where I'm going to place this up, down, just a little bit on my hoop stabilizer. I'll show you that in just a second. But I adjust it so that I can account for this part of the design sliding up under the pillow form in its 3D format. Okay, I'll show you how we're going to do that. All right, this is our fourth hooping. So with the 6x10 embroidery frame, this particular pillow will need five separate hoopings. Three for the stipple panels and two for the embroidery and applique parts. 
So once again, we're going to quickly mark our centers. And on this one, we're not going to need much but our centers. We don't need the edges because our design isn't big enough to go to the edges. So no, I know they're not perfect, but they'll, they'll do. You take your time. Okay, so we want the edge to be no further over than here. So we're going to line that up. We know where our edge of the design is. And then we're going to lay this here and think, hmm. So if we put our design here, we have the center of the fabric is about here. This is five and a half inches. Remember, we're overall 11 inches long. But remember what I said about this part of the pillow wrapping around the pillow form. So if we stitch the design here, that's going to be kind of low on the front of our pocket. Okay? So what we'll do is move this down just a little bit. So I've moved it down just enough to where both, mostly my seam allowance, which is about a half inch, five-eighths of an inch, is down and even with my outer stitch areas, which I've marked on my hoop, remember? Okay. So that means that it moves my design up uh, almost an inch so that this bottom part has room to wrap around and your design won't get caught folding under your pillow. Okay. So does everybody follow? We've lined up the far outside edge as far as we want the design to be. You can center over the half you want or you can use your edges. Either method will suffice and get you where you want to stitch. If you get it on the machine and, and, and your outline says, oh, it looks kind of sideways, stop, come back to the table, think about where you really want it. You can draw even um, fabric marker lines and say, I want the design inside this box. And then run your um, machine placement guide and see if it matches up. If it doesn't match up, then you need to shift your fabric panel. But this method, this part, you do twice. You do the same thing for this side. And you do the same thing for this side. And so then you'll have your design stitched on. Okay? So I'm not going to go over applique and embroidery because we all know how to do that. Or we'll learn in other tutorials how to do those steps. Okay? Alright, so we're going to pretend that this is finished and has all of our pretty little decorative stitching on it. Okay? We're going to pull our other pieces of our pattern out. So here's the pocket lining. We're going to take right sides out, wrong sides together, and we're going to remove our little labels and we're going to pin couple of places. I like to work from the front. That way I can make sure I don't mess up my front. I can afford to mess up the back. It won't show. Okay. All right. So we have a couple pins in that. And so that's, that's just what we want that to, to do. All right. Then we take our binding. When I prep prepare my binding, I first of all iron it all nice and flat, all the way open. I iron all this nice and flat. I starch it well so you can tell how stiff it is. I iron all of this flat, starch it, press it, and then I fold it in half. Iron it and press it again. And then I fold one side in just enough for my hem. You can use a hem marker if you want or a tape measure to make sure it's pretty close all the way down. And then I fold the top over on it. I want to show you my little trick. If you've ever made bias tape before, you probably know this. But you want one side to be just a little bit shorter 
and one side to be just a little bit longer. The reason for that is when we put the long side underneath our panels, it makes the long side be on the back. And so when we're running our front, our top stitching on the front, we're able to ensure that the line of stitching actually catches the thread, I mean the fabric on the back. And I'll show you an example. See how close I am pinned to there? If I flip it over, it's just a little bit longer here. So if you'll always make sure that, that your binding is a tiny bit shorter on the front than it is on the back, you'll never run off the edge of your seams. Now, you'll notice that my binding is the same fabric as the back. There are some tutorials that show keeping this all in one piece. So all you'd have to do would be to add length to your piece. So you've got an 11 inch piece. You would add about 12 and a half to 13 um, total for this piece. And then you would just iron and fold over one side as your binding. Many tutorials show it that way and it's perfectly fine. There's not a right way or a wrong way. There's just lots of different ways to make these pillows. So then I would take this over to the machine and I would run this row of stitching very nice and neat. And I'm not going to take the time to do that here. We're going to just keep moving right along. This can be hand stitched. I've had a lot of people in um, groups ask about um, hand uh, if you have to have a sewing machine. You don't have to have a sewing machine. It sure makes life easier, um, but you can hand stitch the front and the back on this particular piece right here. You can go right through there. You can do a little embroidery decorative stitch if you want. Um, at this point, you would want to hem, iron, and hem this edge of fabric because it's going to be the pop. It's going to help form the envelope where you slide your pillow form in. Okay. All right. So now we have our front pocket and front top of our pillow ready to use. I'm going to use I'm going to take the tag off the back. I'm going to lay it out nice and straight. I'm going to take the top front and I'm going to match the corners. Take that tag off. In the real world, you would have this all nice hemmed and stitched across here, um, but we're not gonna take the time to do either of those stitches. And then you're gonna take and line up the bottom corners of your pocket. You'll notice that after you get done with your stippling, you'll notice the bumps and falls of the fabric going around the quilting have created a slightly altered size. That's perfectly normal. You're gonna, that's all gonna get caught up in the seam allowance and it's not gonna be that important. Okay. So now we take and pin the front top to the front pocket. We are not touching the back. Okay. We are just pinning the front to the front, okay? You wanna run this to the machine and you wanna do a little bit of a basting stitch right down the edge right here so that you wind up with one whole front piece. You want this as one piece completely separate from your back. And that makes it a whole lot easier to handle because now in your brain, instead of having a top and a bottom and a front and a back, and then a front front and a front top, and like all of that stuff can get confusing. But now if you do this, you have the front and the back, and all you have to do is put them together. This greatly simplifies the assembly. 
So if you'll run a little basting stitch right down those two edges real quick and then bring it back to the table, you'll lay them down, match your corners nice and straight, keeping all your layers even and straight. You want to flip it over a couple of times, make sure everything's matched up. See how crooked that wound up when I flipped it? So you kind of want to line it up with the red dots because we know they're straight. And then that significantly straightens things out. You want to run some pins around it and then take it to the machine and stitch all four sides. Um, I use about a half inch seam allowance. 5 eighths, it kind of depends on where this fleece winds up because that's the very, very edge. I try not to include that in my row of stitching. Okay, so then we pin to get the handle in. We're gonna lay the top front down. Let me do it on this one, it's already done much simpler okay so here is our front and our back all stacked together ready to put the handles in and so we've taken we've sewn one strip right down the middle you can leave this seam on the side or you can put it under the in the middle and then iron and press this out okay once you have folded and ironed your handle together, you'll take and find center. So we know it's 18 inches is our overall fabric. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This blue mark, we're gonna make it purple, is our center. And so you wanna measure three inches over one, two, three. And that's going to be, a, I'm a little bit off, but uh, that's going to be about center of your handle. One, two, three. This one's a little better. That's center. So then you pin your handle in with the edges of the handle poking up. Okay? Poking up. So that when you flip it right side out this is what you end up with okay I pinned it so that my folds on my handle faced the back of my pillow just for neatness there's not a right or wrong another thing is if you use if you've ironed this seam on your side you don't have to deal with that at all okay but you just pin it on those marks with your handles poking out. I know that seems backwards the first few times you do it, but it makes perfect sense later. It's sort of like those French seams everybody does. It seems backwards when you're doing it, but then it's beautiful when you're done. So center, and then go over three inches, three inches, attach, pin your handles, and then run your four side seams all the way around. The other thing you wanna do before you turn is take and clip. Can you see that? You want to clip the corners. Otherwise, when you turn, all that fabric bunches up and you don't wind up with a pretty corner. So clip all four corners. Leave just a tiny bit of fabric between the clip and the stitches. So then you've done all your stitching. You want to put thumbnail to fingernail in the corners and keep them together and press that out. And then you wind up with a nice pretty corner. Fingernail to thumbnail. If it's not perfectly straight when you're done or you're not happy with that corner or you don't have nails, I have a lot of family members and friends that don't have nails. They don't grow very long. Just take a chopstick or a pencil eraser 
and press. You can use the head of your pen. If you have nice quilting pens, um, you can take and push the pen down in there. If you do this method, be careful. I have ruined so many corners because I wind up pulling the actual fabric and then I've messed with my beautiful work in a not such good way. All right, folks, look what we've made. We've made a reading pillow with quilted stippled background, two designs on our pocket. If you just wanted one, you could, I have done some where I've done um, the design long ways and only one of them. So if you do that, you could just center your design right here and just put one here. So the, the options are limited, y'all. Like you can put names on here. You can put loads of embroidery. You have this whole big area you can stitch on. You could even put a, put their name up here on this piece, on this panel before you stitch it. Just use extra stabilizer behind the name because this thin cotton does not hold up really well without significant stabilization. Okay, so be careful with all that. Um, I'm going to glance over my notes right quick and make sure I don't have any other tips for you. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to post, um, comment, let us know. We'd like to hear your feedback too about the sound and um, images you're getting. Hopefully things are much better than on the Facebook Live. Um, so, but we'll keep working to improve. You just let us know how we can help, what other tutorials y'all would like to see. Um, good luck, happy stitching, and don't forget that the designs are found, these three designs, the stipple, the fox, and the words, can be found in Designs by Juju's um, Facebook group. Uh, the link is on her website and on her Facebook page. The group name is Designs by Juju Embroidery Blessings Group. So this is Jenny Gallagher for Juju and the whole team. Y'all have a great time making reading pillows. See you next time.